Thank you, Madam Speaker. Members, the People's House. I love it here. I really enjoy each of you. <clears throat> it is a distinct honor to represent the people here. If you'll indulge me, I want to think through this out loud a little bit with you. Aberrant behavior and this body's response, on the face of it, how could that be complicated? How could that possibly be difficult? At issue here, we have a number of principles. And at the end of this conversation, we'll be talking about the tension between protecting the voter franchise and our duty, which each one of us should hold personally responsibility for, of protecting the decency and decorum of our work environment. So we've got a violation of policy. We have a distinct policy. I think everybody in this room that has spent any time looking into that policy around workplace harassment would say it needs help. It's not complete. It's not conclusive. It's not where we want it to be. We need to improve that. But at issue is violation of that policy such that it is. Then we come to the, the next question, and that is a choice of remedy in case of violation of the policy. There is a range of potential remedies that we could take. You could do something simple and administrative on the very low end. You could do something like expulsion, overturning an election on the extreme other end. We are confronted, each one of us, and this came out clearly in the caucus meeting, the joint caucus meeting we had yesterday, we, each one of us, may apply one of 65 potentially different standards of judgment to the question before us. So it is my perspective as I think this through and work to deal with the tension in this decision, it's my perspective that the more punitive the remedy that we seek, the higher the standard I should hold myself to and my judgment to. Because at the end of the day, I'm speaking on behalf of the people of Colorado. And I'm going to take a brief moment to walk down a pathway that Emerson gave us through the mellifluous tones of Representative Melton, discussing pebbles that we can trip on along the way. It is my perspective that these pebbles are very, very important. And process is very, very important because it is in that process that we do things like defend people from harassment, defend people from retaliation, and defend our country to remain the beautiful country that it is. So we need to consider these pebbles carefully as we walk along. In this particular instance, the only offered remedy is the most extreme possible remedy, expulsion, removing someone from the body. And that creates for me an uncomfortable position. Now, I will be candid with you. I have not made my final decision on this because I want to listen carefully to as much information as I can gather in the course of this conversation, given the fact that we've been somewhat hurried, that the information that we have had access to has been somewhat confusing, and I would argue incomplete. I still haven't incidentally had an opportunity to hear the audio tape. Don't know that it would turn my perspective, but just as a footnote, I have still not had an opportunity to hear that audio tape. So, we're in, in my perspective, the unenviable position of making a judgment between these competing principles, protection of the voter franchise or protection of the decency of our workplace. I would have preferred, quite frankly, a pathway that gave us the opportunity to do both with authority. And I think potentially that pathway could have been made available. But alas, that is not the choice before us. 
We've heard, and we heard a response back just now, to what I think, as I've been walking through this, has become potentially the most compelling part of this discussion, because we leave the realm of he said, she said, and we enter the realm of clearly definable activity. In fact, activity that we have all been exposed to, and that is this concept of retaliation. I don't know that this particular judgment, based on whatever standard you may be applying to the decision you will make, will be satisfied by that or not. Now let me close, and I try not to speak personally from the well that often, but I have a four-month-old granddaughter who is the daughter of my 30-year-old daughter. I love them both, obviously. My daughter has been subjected to unnecessary and inappropriate harassment. I do not want my granddaughter to grow up in a world where that is a matter. So I think no matter how we get there, what the process is, as flawed as this particular process may be, I think it is incumbent upon us, and I take it as a personal challenge, to in fact do the work necessary to change the culture by putting my hands on whatever levers of power I can put my hands on, to change the culture so that the future for my granddaughter is different than the future that my daughter has been in, that is different than the reality that we are discussing in this particular set of facts. It resonated with me strongly when Rep. Sias spoke earlier and reflected on another circumstance similar, not perfectly analogous, but similar the words of Senator, United States Senator Packwood, I am aware of the dishonor that has befallen me in the last three years, a tearful senator told the hushed chamber. It is my duty to resign. Later he added, I leave this institution not with malice but with love. I will continue to contemplate. I obviously will come to a conclusion because that is what the people have sent me here to do. In this moment, I remain undetermined. Thank you for letting me think out loud with you, members.